I'm going to be talking about solutions for the smaller ED. And before you big ED folks check out, what's the best way to run a large ED? You break it down into zones and areas and adapt some of the smaller ED strategies, right? Because which are the most efficient, high-performing EDs, EDs under 20,000 volume visits, that's the sweet spot. That's where it's easy to perform. So how many of you do I have that are in a, a 20,000 or less ER? Maybe a rural ER, critical access? Great. I got anybody 20 to 30? Just to kind of know where you live and breathe. Uh, 30 to 40? Okay, we'll jump right up. Who's over 60? It's getting gnarly. Yeah, over 80? Over 100? Okay, so uh, for the, the high volume folks, I would like to just offer, suggest that some of these ideas, some might work in a smaller zone in your ER, okay? So instead of checking out, just hear me out here. So we'll frame the problem and then talk about some of the solutions. We have a lot of workforce challenges, both in rural uh, America and in the smaller EDs, and actually they often go together. Often our rural hospitals are also our smaller EDs. Do you know that 20% of the population in this country lives in a rural area, but only 8% of doctors want to work there? This is very exciting news, and you may not have heard this, Dr. Seberg, who's going to talk tomorrow, he's one of our speakers, he is intensely involved now with starting a rural emergency medicine residency, and I believe it's long overdue. What do y'all think, right? We, we need to train, and it's going to be a different specialty. It's going to look different. Uh, so uh, it's, on that note, um, one of the biggest challenges for you in a smaller ER is the single coverage and how do you make your department flex when you have one provider. How many of you have one provider part of the day? Okay, actually many more of you, because most of you are going to drop down after midnight, uh, and, and that's the challenge. So some of the solutions, we're going to look at advanced triage order sets, we're going to look at pit on demand, which that's kind of a new idea you might not have thought of. Uh, admission holding spaces, we, we've, we'll cross that over that a few times. Flex shifts, cross-training that concept, an assembly line model, which I don't know if any of you have heard of this, and then latch on to virtual, virtual staffing, because that's probably going to be a big part of some of the smaller EDs, ways that we operate them. So how many of you have advanced triage order sets, nurse-initiated orders, chief complaint-driven order sets? Great. Can I tell you what? Like, even 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I didn't see that many hands. So this means you actually got your doctors to agree to a set of orders based on chief complaint. That's really remarkable. For those of you who don't have them, I, ha I collect them. This is what an OCD woman does in her spare time, right? I collect things like this. I've got a file of advanced triage order sets. Um, they are typically chief complaint driven, always standardized. We tend to make them diagnostic, but you may want to draw the line on imaging. Why? Because increasingly, emergency physicians are having their feet held to the fire on utilization of imaging. And so you may not want to have the imaging ordered just based on the order set. When you do do that, there is a tendency to overorder. Do you notice? Do you know that? If you've got advanced triage order sets and you look at utilization compared to putting a physician in triage, you will see a big difference. There's less when the physician is out there. Um, what about medications? Anybody have any medications besides, say, aspirin in chest pain? Anybody have any, any medications that a nurse can just give just by protocol in your department? Anybody? Sh tell me what you were doing. Sorry? Oh, Narcan and Ativan. Okay, okay. Ativan they can give without a... Okay, what else? What else? Antipyretics. Antipyretics, yeah. Because I think one of the best things you can do is have a standardized order for some of this puke, and oh my gosh, there's nothing worse than that, right? There's nothing worse than that. What else? Zofran, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, and I feel like that's, that is a, a appropriate, that's more cutting edge. Um, and you'll, you'll have to decide within your group what you're comfortable empowering your nurses to do. 
Uh, but I think it's time has come. We fought the battle with, with ENA and other organizations many years ago. These are kind of part and parcel. I believe even if you're a busy ER, it's not bad to have a set of these so that if you do drop down to your one doctor at night and he's running a code, your nurse can still do something when a patient arrives. So these are the ones that I think are an absolute must. Do most of you have all of these? So do you know when I, um, I did the flank pain one because, picture the scenario, I go in a room and I see chief complaint flank pain and there's a poor gentleman, he's diaphoretic, he's laying over the stretcher holding his, his flank and puking into one of those blue plastic bags, right? One of the little barf bags. And there's a little medical student sit, sitting next to him saying, tell me about your family history. And I thought, there's something wrong with this. To come to find out, said patient was a board member, of course, right? So we immediately implemented a, a, a flank pain order set. And I had just wanted to give Toradol for flank pain, Tor, Toradol and Zofran, I wanted on autopilot for my flank pains. And you can kick out with fever, kick out with hypertension because they might be an aneurysm, right? You can write these kind of protocols. Uh, and so we, we stood that up. My group wanted to give for, for uh, flank pain fentanyl. And I was like, all righty then. If you have a, a kidney stone, come to my ER. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to love it. It's going to be a great experience. Uh, but, I, but I've got them for all of these, uh, if anyone would like to see them. Sometimes it's nice to see what somebody else is doing, right? Uh, and there are some variations around the country, but I believe you should have these on hand uh, to be employed, not just a smaller ER, but if you've got ever in a predicament where there may not be an attending to get things started, this is a great way to go. All right, so physician and triage. Heretofore, we've sort of known that some of these innovations don't make sense at a really low volume. Certainly in a small ER, you're not gonna do physician and triage. You've got one doctor, it's just not gonna work. So I, I kind of see things marching roughly out like this. And I, someone can argue with me because I have no data for this. I'm just telling you what I've seen in ERs that's working. As you reach a point where single coverage is no longer enough, then you have to decide, are we going to do a fast track? Gee, a pit might be nice. What are we going to do? Eventually, you need both and a mid track, right? Uh, and then eventually, you need all of it and an admission holding unit. So these are just rough guidelines. And as I say, absolutely not based in anything other than Sherry Welch's brain, OK, and experience. Um, Though, although I will pick on some of my colleagues. Jim, what do you think about those rough guidelines for you need a fast track, you need mid track, whatever? Close? OK, thank you. There, <laughs> case made. Mm -hmm. well, so that's a good point. And that's, it's interesting because uh, you know, initially it was all uh, attending. And I prefer an attending to an APP I, for, for the, the same reason I don't like a residence out there. But now, you know what? I was just perusing AAEM's database where they actually tell you what everybody's doing. And I'm seeing all kinds of combinations. I think the junior residents are the mistake, the very junior residents, if you're at a teaching hospital, introducing them, because it needs to be a fast and furious assessment. I like a senior doctor, and to be honest, it's a great job for some of us oldsters. I'm done running around the ER doing traumas. I did that, had been there, done that. I know sick when I see it. Put me out there and let me sit there and say sick, not sick, mid-track, fast-track, main ED, psych ED. Like, let me do the sorting because I can bring that level of expertise. But can I tell you what? I've seen all kinds of variations. And one thing is humbling as you go around to different ERs. Everything that I've ever stomped my foot and said, you know, it has to be an attending physician. It can't be an APP. Then someone shows me someplace where an APP is working very nicely out there. So provider, good point. Provider and triage, let's call it that. So you know we have uh, this kind of arrival curve for, for everyone. This is showing you a lower volume ED, their arrivals. And it starts to get gnarly late morning, doesn't it? Where it may be maybe too much for one doctor to handle. So, and I had a senior moment, I put this slide in twice, so we're gonna fly by it the second time. This is showing you an emergency department, Providence St. Mary's, where this room nobody actually really liked. Nurses didn't like it, doctors didn't like it for putting patients in. It was a, t a double room, but it was really tight. So what they did, and I thought this was very, very clever, is they decided when I now have all my rooms full, patients are still coming, and I have a provider that can see them, we will do a physician in triage model in this little space. 
And even if the patient has to go back to the waiting room, uh, they cordon off and separate out, you know, the, it's a results waiting room now, and the workup can start. Patients can even get an, uh, a dose of Zofran and then go back out there. So they do, it's a pit on demand. It's, uh-oh, we need this. We have a doctor, we have a patient, we don't have space. Let's create one and do it ad hoc. And it's working very well for them. Now this, this is an even smaller ED, where they only ever have single coverage. And I think this was nine rooms. This is in New Hampshire. And this chair... And see, do you see they brought over just a little tray, a, a computer they put on it, a little chair. That becomes when they are full, but their patient's still coming, and a doctor can go see them, they're doing it right there. I know it's a hallway, but you know, we improvise it in the ER, don't we? So that's literally their pit on demand at a very low volume place. By the way, no one, you, you really are more private than you would think. There's nobody in that back hall, the supply room, as you can see, which is one of the nicest supply rooms I've ever been in. That's, that, that little space is actually more secluded than you would think. And, and a patient can at least have a discussion with the doctor and get some of their workup started. And we're, we're ignoring that. Okay, admission holding space. So you're a small ER. How about that's your admission holding space? I mean, a, a small ED holding three patients can be brought to its knees. If you've only got nine beds, that's a third of your capacity. So putting chairs in a place and saying, this is where we're going to hold our admissions until their beds are ready. And by the way, you should be having regular conversations with uh, labor and delivery, and infusion therapy. Why? Why would I say that? Well, that's weird. What kind of conversations do we need to have with them? Anybody? They got the chairs. Got the chairs. Right, exactly. And mind you, they turn those over pretty quickly, and I'm not above saying, give me your, uh, your uh, you know, lounge chairs when you're replacing the old ones. Give me the old ones. We sorted through them, and I've done this many places. In fact, it's often a nice way to stand up your first vertical model your first vertical model, when you just want to have proof of concept, grab you some lounge chairs and, and use those to sort of set up your vertical model. Uh, this is showing you a, a nicer one where they actually got something that's more akin to a bed, another admission holding unit. Uh, and m what I'm seeing is spaces where you ha are, have multiple occupancy, we're often putting people in for an admission holding unit on their way upstairs. Uh, how about this? They actually use a stretcher in the hall. They can actually put a couple of them, and they consider that their holding unit. I like that better. You know, how many of you are working? Let's just get this out of the way. How many of you have hallway beds? Anybody not have hallway beds? That, that's a smaller proposition. Okay. Um, I feel like if you're going to use your hallway beds, let's not use them for a new patient encounter. Let's use them for somebody, we know the diagnosis, we know the treatment plan, we know where they're going, they're in hand, so to speak. And I get a lot of argument like, well, that pa that's, patients don't like that, that's a patient dissatisfier. And I'm like, yeah, well, patients waiting in the waiting room for hours and hours is also a dissatisfier. So using hallway beds, let's use them and be very thoughtful of how we use them. If we have to use them, let's use them for patients that we, we understand their story. Does, does anybody want to challenge me on that, or do, do you all agree? Does that kind of make sense? You know, they're, the dangerous ones are the ones that you don't know what's going on, don't have enough information. They're in the waiting room. You know, you haven't had a chance to properly uh, uh, um, evaluate them. Now, this ED, this is Presbyterian in Philadelphia. This is the coolest ever. Part of the day, those hallways, which Jay mentioned putting up dividers to give a little bit of privacy there, those hallway beds are used part of the day as a mid-track and then at night as an admission holding area. And I mean, I don't like it, guys. I just don't want you to think this, this, is, this is the joy of my life is having patient care delivered this way. But we, we, capacity is at crisis points in most places. And I, I like this. If I have to do it, this is a better way to do it, let's just say. Uh, this, anybody got a big room? This is such a holdover. For, this really kind of, kind of dates your ER. If you've got a big room, it's probably from the 90s or before. Anybody have a big room with a bunch of curtains? That, that doesn't, uh, doesn't um, 
you know, uh, run amok by, when you use it for an emission holding unit. And in fact, I, I probably mentioned this before, Penn State Hershey, when I was there, they had a room, it was five large rooms, sort of, with curtains between them. They put more curtains, made them 10, and put all their admission holding uh, patients in there and had policies and procedures and protocols. I much prefer what you saw on that slide this morning where UT San Antonio had a very nice space uh, that was away from the ER that was its own space that was, you know, just a lo looked a little bit, you know, fun more functional. But you can do this. And by the way, our all of you, when you build your new ER, are you building it so that one room can become two? That you can pull a curtain and create double capacity? Make sure that you are doing that because we're, that's how you're going to handle surge. That's going to how you're going to handle, you know, mass casualty events and so forth. Is being able to pull. And oh, by the way, little aside, Epic has to follow that. So EPIC has to be built, or, or Cerner, whichever your EMR is, it has to be able to convert so that room, you know, bay 16, it can be 16 A and B and so forth. That makes sense? Uh, this was built, and this is something I really disapprove of, and those of you who stay for the design course, you can get the opinion of Jim and the architect and so forth. This was an ambulance arrival area. Oh my gosh, I, I just don't like building an ambulance arrival area, especially one very big, a small area, that's fine. But this place actually had, I think they had a total of 12 bays that you could arrive ambulances, and then what happened? They just stayed in an ambulance arrival. So I, I said to them when they finally got all of their operations better, hey, how about if we use this for admission holding? You know, that we're getting ready to launch them, let's put them in an area like this. All right, flexing shifts. This is uh, the Helen DeVos pediatric ER, and this is the first place that I've heard of this. Um, how many of you have doctors on call? Do you have somebody that you call in? Do you have an on call? I know, and it's funny because we went into emergency medicine because we didn't want that, right? We didn't want to want to be on call. Is there another way to do it? Well, so I, I learned this from them, and I'm starting to see this more and more. They have an on call shift that is on their schedule. It's where they, they actually started to sort and do patient segmentation. They've got their pediatric ER is busy enough that they have a uh, sort of a mid track, fast track, and then regular ED. Any pediatric ED people here? Anybody? Well, good. We're really glad, really glad to have you. Uh, in any case, what they did is this shift is by definition four hours to start. And then based on very objective information that both doctors and nurses agree on, it may become eight hours, it may become 12 hours. What do you think of that? And they do, they st uh, uh, the nurses can pick these shifts up as well. What do you think? I mean, to me, I would rather have that than be at, you know, my kid's sport activity and have to go in because it's busy. So it's turning out to be more pleasing because think you're doing the happy dance when at four hours you get to go home but you leave the house in the morning and say honey i'm i might be home at four i might be home at eight i might be home at 12. see you tomorrow right anybody doing anything like that flexing a provider shift flexing nursing shifts i know you probably call off somebody but this is a little bit more planned out and they they do call it the at-risk shift how do you like that I wonder if we couldn't come up with something more positive than that, but the at-risk shift. So I th believe that because the variation that we're seeing in arrival seems so great to me, I think we're going to be doing more of that even in larger uh, EDs. There's not just smaller EDs that are going to feel that. All right, cross-training. Um, anybody got an x-ray tech that can also do CTs? Yeah, cool. I love it. I love it. I think that's wildly efficient, and I think it's worth a hospital investing in training somebody in, in both. Anybody, for, especially you smaller ED folk, anybody have someone on call for CT or on call for ultrasound or on call for x-ray, whatever? Yeah, I, th I think it's very hard, isn't it? Because then you're sort of struggling, oh, I hate to call them in, but I really need the answer and, and so forth. So cross-training for the small ER can be a very effective, efficient you know, uh, idea. Uh, then think about the other things that you need in the department. Can we cross-train people? So some of the ones I've seen, I've seen phlebotomy and EKG cross-trained. I know it seems weird, but the, the same people could do both. 
unit clerks and ED tech, I don't like that as much because then you have a clerical and a clinical mixing, but I've, I've seen that. I do like ED tech and ED transporters. By the way, if your ER is truly fluid, if we are saying what we said before, no one owns a bed. They are in the bed when we need it for examining, when we need it for treating, and then they may be in a, a chair waiting and so forth. If you have fluidity, what are you going to need? You're going to need patients, someone to move patients, just depending on your, your layout, right? You may need more transporters to move people around, especially those of you who are standing up a pit model where somebody's seen by a doctor and now they're going to go someplace else. You now have a very real need for transport in your department. Uh, so, and here's, here's the break, and I'm, I'm intensely interested in this. How many of you are using CNAs? CNAs? Much, not, not as many as I thought. Versus techs, if that was the question. Are you using CNAs to support nursing or techs? Let's see it again. CNAs and techs. Yeah, I see, and you know why we've gone there? because it is so much easier to train them to do a lot of different things. If we own the training and the cert certification, we can train them to do many things. And I've had uh, techs trained in ultrasound guided IVs. What do you think of that? They love their jobs. There's so much job satisfaction. You can train your personnel in your ED if you're doing the, the um, certifications. When it comes under the state, mm, right? Because how many of you do you even know, are your CNAs allowed to put in Foley's? You know, there's just, there's so many restrictions. And so I, as you're thinking about building out your workforce for the ED, I like actually unlicensed personnel. Who's using paramedics in the ER? Anybody? Yeah, this is a growing trend. Now, the only thing is sometimes I'm finding, you know, uh, different, you know, state regulatory people coming in and getting in the way. Like, I feel like if they can do it in a rig, why can't they do it in my ER? And that's why I like them. I feel like they are so multi-purpose, you can deploy them in so many different areas. But sometimes I'm seeing the state step, uh, step in. Um, how about, who, anybody heard of this? Unlicensed assistive personnel. These are like home health aides, kind of? Uh, so is there a room in your department for people like that? People that before we maybe only saw in nursing homes, like a, a much one of the lowest levels of training. Do we need some of those folks? I think as the population ages and we're all taking care of more geriatric people, sometimes we need someone to just help a patient to the commode, right? Just help them get their clothes on and so forth. So maybe you need some of those uh, for your staff to help build out your staffing. All right, this came from Kirk Jensen, and I can't claim to be intensely familiar with it, uh, but he gave me the slides, and I, and I like the idea. And remember, I would consider it for the right ED with the right geography. I'd also consider it perhaps maybe in a mid-track with, with a model like this. Basically, everything happens to you in an assembly line fashion. You'd come in and get your quick reg and triage, then your EKG if you need one, labs, and you're constantly moving around in little areas that look like the bottom of the picture there. So could you see how, I mean, there's some places that absolutely famously would not work because the layout wouldn't lend itself, but could you see how this assembly line processing might work? And remember, you would rotate for, for the nurses that are going, oh, none of my nurses want to do that. What if you let them rotate around? You know, you could do, you're doing IVs, you're doing blood draws, you're doing EKGs, whatever and they were showing how they moved around the department. And I got to thinking, could that work in a mid-track? It, it, maybe it could, since you're keeping patients vertical. Uh, and of course, everyone does everyone now have some acuity adaptable space, something that you could run you know, some serious medical treatment in, but you could also pull down the garage door and make it be behavioral health. Who's got that? Yeah. I mean, it, this is, it's too, too good to pass up. They're not that expensive, and they, they really give you a lot of flexibility. And so especially, like I say, uh, a, a smaller emergency department needs to embrace all of these ideas that help them build in flex in their department. All right, and then virtual staffing. Who's doing telemedicine triage in their ER? Anybody? Okay, cool. I think this is uh, another blue ocean strategy for us. And I, I especially could see it be applied to smaller EDs. So using telemedicine triage, if you can picture it, you are remote 
doing that initial assessment. And you might have not bought into it before, but COVID changed everything, didn't it? Because telehealth is, is uh, you know, really now quite accepted and, and uh, quite prevalent. So one, one uh, command center might be seeing many, many departments, and you could see how this could work well in, say, a rural small ED, and then maybe you staff it with a nurse practitioner would carry out of the orders and follow up on the patient. This is just showing you the, the sort of pod concept of them looking at it.